Light really influences our lives. A lot of the time we take it for granted. We don't really sort of notice it. You can actually change people's moods through lighting design without them realizing that they're being sort of influenced uh, in that way. I'm Mark Major. I'm a lighting designer and uh, here we are at my uh, studio in London. I work uh, with buildings, uh, with cities, uh, with the built environment. We as humans follow a certain kind of rhythm, but obviously society has progressed such that we want to extend the day. Lighting design is a discipline in which somebody comes up with solutions for how you can create a great experience for people, functionality for people, or with the right light, create a, a mood uh, or a, a, an ambience uh, for a space. And the thing that most interests me uh, as a lighting designer, and maybe this comes out of my architectural background, is the increasing lack of division between the inside and the outside. Quite often when we're in the city these days, when are you really inside and when are you really outside? Even with a glass tower building, by day, maybe the glass is very reflective. We don't see into the building too well. At night, suddenly the landscape of all of the desks and everything, the building becomes transparent. This joins our visual landscape. It becomes a much more visual part of the city. I think there have been a few uh, big projects uh, for me that were uh, very uh, important. Certainly one of those was working uh, on uh, Terminal 5 at uh, Heathrow. The first time I ever landed at Terminal 5, experiencing in a way what we had designed. After dark and seeing how well that worked, I mean, wow, that was really exciting. When our firm did the, uh, uh, the Grand Mosque project, and it was this uh, idea that the mosque was somehow bathed in moonlight. As uh, the moon disappears over the month, then uh, slowly the mosque goes bluer and deeper and bluer and deeper until there's no moon, so there's no white light on the mosque. I mean, in a way, it's obviously a very artificial conceit, but nonetheless very sort of poetic and beautiful. Light pollution is a critical issue and a growing problem. Firstly, it prevents us seeing the stars. That connection to the stars is part of our natural being. Secondly, it can have really strong impacts on the ecosystems within our city. It can affect birds, it can affect all sorts of uh, flora and uh, fauna. Finally, and importantly, it affects human beings. I mean, if you live right in the center of a very light polluted city, never getting darkness is actually quite foreign to our species. The absence of light is something that actually is physically important for us. Uh, we're here on London's South Bank on what's known as the Queen's Walk. Just at the end of Blackfriars Bridge is Unilever House, uh, which uh, we illuminated a few years ago. We're currently working on a lighting scheme for the exterior of St Paul's Cathedral, but in fact we also relit the interior of uh, that uh, uh, very famous iconic building. This large tower you can see in the foreground that uh, is still under construction is uh, the Leadenhall project uh, by Richard Rogers, and just behind that you can see 30 St Mary Axe, uh, which is the project we will be visiting later tonight. We completed a project here a few years ago. There are a number of uh, mature London plane trees uh, in which we put a series of white and blue uh, LED lamps. One of the things that's very interesting about it is that uh, people seem to respond to it uh, very well. It, and what's also interesting about it is that it's not very bright. I mean, actually for a busy area of the city, it's actually relatively dark here, but generally speaking, it feels very safe and people appear to feel very comfortable with uh, the lighting scheme. It's very different, uh, this idea that you can um, uh, illuminate public space, this idea that you can sort of treat um, parts of the city like outdoor rooms uh, in which you create atmosphere and you create ambience is uh, something that's uh, not so usual and uh, it's something certainly we do a lot. Now we're at 30 St Mary Axe, um, which is affectionately known as uh, the Gherkin. I always get excited when I see projects that I've worked on and, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I'm not the architect and uh, when you see a building that you've worked on in a movie, 
it's really uh, amazing and actually I've been lucky enough to have worked on several buildings that have appeared in really interesting movies, actually most of them James Bond <laughs> and that's always good. <laughs> This building is um, uh, very well known for being a very green building. It has very good daylight. Light being a very visible form of energy, it was very important uh, to get the balance right with the lighting. So the decision was, in a curious way, and I think quite innovative at the time, not to light to the building. You can uh, understand, uh, still understand, the sort of spiral nature of uh, the building. Um, uh, even at night, just by through the pattern of occupation and the interior lighting. Whilst we're looking at this economic and social balance, we must understand that light is a, you know, uses energy, and so we must uh, therefore meet these two criteria, um, but uh, in a very responsible way, trying to do that using as little energy as possible. I think really, good lighting can improve people's lives by helping them to sort of feel better. If we can um, really understand the way that light is used better, I think that we can really create cities in particular, public spaces, individual buildings, etc. that when you visit them after dark or you experience them after dark, they're really very special places to be. Places that you remember and places that you enjoy.